Coindesk is turning 10, so we're taking a look back at some of our biggest stories in crypto in the last decade. And our next guest is one of those invariably included in conversations about crypto and Bitcoin in the past 10 years. So joining us now to discuss is Strike CEO and founder Jack Mahlers. Welcome, Jack. What's up, man? How are you? Thanks What's for having up? me. Good to see you, and I'm glad to see that famous closet behind you. So. We have to talk about it, right? We have a congested Bitcoin blockchain right now. Fee rates are high. Lightning seems to be the solution for those who are already onboarded. But LN requires commitment transactions to open channels, which are expensive. So how do we onboard users to the faster, cheaper Lightning network when, you know, layer one is getting so expensive and out of hand? Um, there's a lot of protocol enhancements we could use. There's things like channel factories that can be built. Uh, to be totally candid with you, man, uh, I haven't been spending too much time in this debate. I think it's useless and it's pointless and it's stupid. And uh, lightning works. Uh, that doesn't mean it can't get better. It doesn't mean that it's not perfect. And people use block space. That's how Bitcoin is designed. I don't really understand why that's such a big uh, deal. So I don't know what universe everyone else is living in, but the universe that I'm living in, Company's doing great. My nodes are doing great. Everything is cool where I sit. Um, so I don't know if there's anything specific you want to talk about, but uh, I think Lightning and Bitcoin's working as intended. Yeah, I, I just want to talk about so the future state of Lightning. When we have billions of Bitcoiners and it's going to be busy on the on the Blair One blockchain, how are we going to get everyone to use the Lightning network? Uh, I think the free market will figure that out. Um, I don't know. I like. I mean, listen, George, I can sit here and give you my best guess, but that's going to be clipped on Twitter and people are going to make a big whoop about it. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of things like channel. Fa I mean, the, the protocol is going to evolve. And if as we need tools, we could use state chains. We could use side chains. There's a lot of things the Lightning Network can do a better job of. And I think the free market is going to decide on, well, how much of these experiences can be done in a custodial manner, manner. And we could use things like Cashew that still retain properties like privacy. I just don't think it's like such a big deal. It's like, how is humanity going to figure out a way to live once all of our resources on Earth are used to the extent in which there's no more room on this planet? Like, I don't know, man. I don't know. I guess we go to Mars. I think we'll figure it out, right? Like, I don't know. What, like, what? I don't know. Like, I don't know. I think it's all, it's all good problems to have. And um, Bitcoin's working and it's not going anywhere. And uh, this is awesome news for a guy that's been in this industry for 10 years. This is a lot of fun. Yeah. I think it makes a lot of sense. But so, Jack, let's talk a little bit about Strike. A lot has changed since those Olympus days, right? So Strike has mm -hmm. slowly but surely added useful sounding features to its product offering. And I want to ask about two of the newer ones. You have the API and you have Send Globally. So first for the API, help me out here. What is an API and how can the API be used by businesses to make our lives easier and more convenient? Yeah, API stands for Application Program Interface. It's a technical thing. Uh, it's our way of getting everything we've built to institutions and enterprises that want to use things like the Lightning Network and achieve things we've achieved. It is a son of a gun, uh, to put it uh, rated E for everybody, to go get licenses and build the level of in infrastructure, compliance, and regulation to do what we do. And so when companies the mempool or companies see things like me being able to make an instant cross currency payment to Africa to and from and they want to use that and they want to leverage that this is just our ability of send here take what I got um, because it's probably not worth you go doing it yourself maybe it is maybe it isn't but it's our way to work with businesses and the payment processing industry exchanges in the industry payroll companies companies that are repatriating revenue out of West Africa so we have a plethora of customers a wide array of folks that want to use lightning and want to use what we have uh, and send globally, I think, you know, George, it sounds like you've been following uh, my career for a long time, and I deeply respect that, man. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm on a mission and in, in to find where Lightning solves problems today. Everyone knows my vicious uh, leap into payment processing and NCR, and we're trying to figure that out. There's cross-currency payments. We've turned into one of the biggest Bitcoin brokerages in the United States, and we want to expand that globally. And so we've been on a mission of we're very confident uh, and convicted in Bitcoin as a, as a monetary instrument and Lightning as a payment technology, and we're just really seeking and where we can solve problems today for people, and Send Globally seems to be an obvious one. Yeah, so for Send Globally, this feels appropriately tailor-made for remittances, right? Is that the inspiration for having built that? 
Yeah, exactly. Um, I think in what we figured out along with a lot of the bigger companies we work with is like when I walk into Whole Foods, I get rewarded in using Amex. I don't for Lightning. There's still a decent amount of people that want to use Lightning. It carries properties that Visa doesn't, but it it has a lot different of a moat. And I, maybe I'll talk about that more in a blog post or a podcast. When you allow someone to send money into Nigeria where you're getting a 60% better exchange rate and it's in your ma's Nigerian bank account in about 15 seconds, you're solving a consumer need right then and there. That's a huge deal. And that's the type of product that someone uses, their jaw hits the floor, and then they go tell all their friends about. And that just means that it's solving a problem right now. And so it's not just the speed and the cost, but also crossing currency through an open public utility. So the market is a lot more free in pricing these currencies, which maybe we don't need for the dollar euro market, but the dollar naira market, the dollar SETI market, you're seeing 50, 60, 70% efficiencies. And so on a B2B and B2C level, it's really organic growth and value uh, for us to deliver to customers. And it's been a journey for us to figure that out, but we're super proud of it and it's growing and it's valuable. Yeah, Jack, I have to ask, before before Send Globally, I was able to send Stri- use, send Bitcoin via Strike to my family abroad. How does How is this different? Is there a little different mechanism in there? Is it going straight to a bank account? What's the difference between just the regular Bitcoin transactions I was sending before? Yeah, um, so like the use case is I have dollars in my possession somehow, whether it's in a bank account, it's on a debit card, it's in an application, and I want that value as Naira in my Moz bank account. And that's a very common problem that people have is that as interconnected we are in information and in communication with the internet, we're not so with money. And so you're faced with, it could either be really slow, a terrible experience, really expensive, all of the above. And a lot of the times you have liquidity who clears cross-currency liquidity or central banks and so if a nigerian central bank is fixing the price of how valuable their actual currency is um, then you're getting ripped off too and so we just solved that so we can take the dollars from you turn it into bitcoin send it to nigeria and then work with partners or ourselves to turn it back into Naira and put it in your Ma's bank account, all in one seamless experience. So maybe it doesn't suit, maybe if you run your own node, George, and you are like a wizard with cryptography and um, that's awesome. And we encourage that too. Um, But for the folks that are just simply trying to log into an app, enter $20 in their Ma's bank account, and then their Ma can use it and go grocery shopping that same hour, um, it solves that problem pretty effortlessly with like a fabulous open, uh, exchange rate, which is pretty cool. Yeah, Jack, you talked a little bit about how Strike is a big, important brokerage now. We're working towards that. How does Strike fit into the "not your keys, not your cheese" narrative that is top of mind that we've had? You know, catastrophic collapse of pro- a prominent exchange that I won't name. Yeah. Oh, why not name? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, the uh, I think we. So when I founded this company. Never in my wildest dreams did I think that we would be the brand that we are and we would be the place to acquire Bitcoin that we've become. Um, But you give the people what they want and we are really proud of that. And over the next few weeks, we've got some announcements that I think people are going to be super happy about. Even the application as you use it today isn't super tailored. There's all sorts of weird limits. Um, There's weird restrictions where if you want to buy Bitcoin, we got it and we'll sell it to you. And um, we're proud of that. I would say Strike is probably one of the fastest ways to go from dollars in your bank account to Bitcoin in your cold storage. We allow instant withdrawals up to certain thresholds. We pride ourselves on being one of the cheapest places to acquire. Um, We encourage users, I don't want your Bitcoin. I'm happy to custody it for you if you need me to, but I don't want to and I encourage you to. And we show that in our product. We don't put like withdrawal holdings on any of the purchases. We've invested a lot of infrastructure, fraud detection, um, compliance, and regulation to make sure that a user can go from $200 in their bank account to $200 uh, $200 worth of Bitcoin in their cold storage in about 20 seconds. And uh, we're proud of that. Yeah. You mentioned regulation policy. So I want to kind of pull back and ask you about your recent, you spoke recently at the Bitcoin Policy Summit in Washington. What was the general vibe you got from lawmakers and regulators you spoke to while you were there? The vibe was lit, as the kids say. Um, My take on... uh, DC right now is, and I think it's pretty important to understand that the general public understands how they feel. 
They feel embarrassed, George, because of the exchange that, for whatever reason, you don't want to name. Uh, they feel embarrassed that Sam Sam made a mock of these guys and girls, and they, they feel pretty ashamed and embarrassed that they were used and abused in that way. They're a little humiliated. I think that there's a decent amount of pressure, George, that the United States not only is looked upon as the best and biggest financial market in the world, but it's a asset that, as a country, we weaponize that. We use the liquidity and the resiliency and the reliability of something like Wall Street on a global macroeconomic scale. We use that as an asset to this country. And it's being generally threatened that you can go on a public company's website and you could buy flip a dookie bookie coin and that all of a sudden the American public is getting rug pulled and defrauded in broad daylight. So it's both a little bit of vengeance that these people are like, you know what, I really want to understand what's going on. I really want to understand the value. And we have to start protecting what is the most prominent financial market in the world as a country. And I think think that there's a lot of renewed energy of like, all right, I've had enough of looking at Justin Bell little kids to buy certain coins. I want to understand how this asset can be beneficial to us as a country and be beneficial to the American individual. Uh, and then what needs to be regulated should be because we're starting to cross the line of what's unacceptable um, in the United States. And I felt that loud and clear and I was proud to be there. It was pretty cool. Yeah, Jack, real quick, I want to get a last one out of you. I'm going to ask about your favorite topic and that's the Fed. What's the Fed going to do and how does Bitcoin and Strike fit into that? Uh, the Fed is screwed. Um, I remember I went on CNBC. No, uh, seriously, I'll, I'll rant for a second here and then I'll be out of your hair. I, I went on CNBC and uh, Kelly, who I love and adore, I love the relationship I have with Kelly and Tyler and CNBC, but they had the audacity to sit and tell me that this banking crisis was deflationary. Um, couldn't be further from the truth, George. The Fed has mismanaged monetary policy, arguably worse than they ever have before. And you don't have to take my word for it. If you don't believe me, look at Russia, look at the UAE, look at everyone is starting to orchestrate and organize global trade outside of the US dollar, George. What the Fed, the Fed looks and feels like they're in the corner of a boxing ring, covering yeah. their ribs, covering their chin, and the boxer, they're waiting for the bell to ring. They're waiting for the round to be over. They're waiting to be vaselined up, and everyone's just wailing on the Fed. They mismanaged this entirely. They left rates so low, the excess amount of liquidity injected to the system, combined with the fastest rate hike ever, they bankrupted their own banks. The right. banks, in order for the banks to survive, George, they're going to have to sell the Fed bonds, and the Fed can't afford that, so they're not going to meet 2% inflation. We're going to live in a new era of dollar inflation. Dollar inflation may land at four, five, six, seven percent in perpetuity. And that's what you're seeing with the reaction from gold. So the writing's on the wall. Anyone with a brain knows that you got to invest in gold. You got to invest in Bitcoin. Any asset with a supply cap, which implies they don't have a relationship with rates, which implies that there's a much more authentic to supply demand it's already being priced in and uh the fed screwed up and it's a yeah. really big deal uh and uh it's good for bitcoin that's what i gotta say sounds good jack thanks for joining us it was good to have you thanks brother see you around. that was jack maulers from strike